So welcome back to What is Enough, part two. We said all change is personal. Why? Because no one can know what you like. You can tell people what you like, but they don't know what that means. If you like an ice cream, how do you really know that you like it? You just like it. Fulfillment is like that. You can't tell someone what's fulfilling to you in a way they can understand it. You simply know when it's fulfilling. So we're going to look at how do we start to get in touch with what fulfilling feels like to us. So in part one, hopefully you've begun making a few notes, things that stood out to you, and you've began the pen thin worksheet because you'll use that as think of it like a report card that creates awareness for you about the fact that you are making money, for example, and you've made a lot of money in your lifetime or will make a lot, and that the likelihood of you keeping a lot and building wealth for the future is often a function of living within your means. And the key to do that and do that in a way that's fulfilling is to find fulfillment in the money that you spend. So a question for you, what did you come to understand in the first round of exercises when you simply looked at your answers to those questions. We're going to do another exercise here, and that is a life rating scale. What I'd like for you to do is look at each of these columns. This is based on another series of life and fulfillment tests that were done many years ago. And ask yourself, if you look at these, which of these numbers best describes your current life rating scale. From one, an overall feeling of uncomfortable, tired, frustrated, fearful, lonely, angry, insecure, to five, joyous, enthusiastic, completely fulfilled, overflowing with joy and ecstasy, powerful, and feeling like you're making a difference. Take a moment, be honest, and if you say I'm a 2.5, that means you feel like you're between two, and three. Do one of these for each of you. If you're doing this with a partner, an accountability partner, a spouse, have them do the same. It's a great discussion to have, beginning to open up for yourself. What is your life like right now? Quality of life, there's actually a QOL. And one of the common things it's considered is, is money for people that make money over a certain amount. Does their quality of life go up? In one study, the quality of life for those under $1,000 in monthly income was higher. And it went down at a certain level. Now, these have been updated more recently, and they show that there's certain correlations and certain points at which the quality of life starts to decrease. And that number's been going up when the study was done back in the early 1990s. Uh, the overall income on a relevant basis was much lower. But when you look at this and you think about quality of life for yourself, there is a point at which the income does not increase your quality of life. In past studies, what's interesting is the particular group doing the study found that most Americans fell between 2.6 and 2.8 on their overall score. So what is normal? Normal for many Americans is getting dressed in clothes that you buy for work, driving in traffic in a car that you're still paying for in order to get to a job that you need so you can pay for the clothes that you use and the car that you drove and the house that you live in, that you leave empty all day in order to be able to afford to live in the house. That's from Ellen Goodman, a columnist. It sounds pretty depressing, but isn't that many ways what a lot of Americans experience as their normal? Well, what we have to do is we're going to go through a series of key steps. And one of the first steps is to face your facts now. In other words, the facts are the facts. Good or bad, they simply are what they are. If you can't face the facts now, you can never bring in the awareness that will possibly change you're experiencing with and of those facts. So through this process, when we say bringing awareness 
It's not about deprivation. It's about more awareness. Why more awareness? Because that awareness is like a solvent that allows you to see things as they are and for real change to happen. We have to accept that overconsumption is normal. It's not normal with animals. It's not normal in most of nature. But in our society, it is normal. Getting is better than having. When you get something, it's new and exciting. When you have something, you take it for granted and it's boring. But everything you get turns into something you have. That's why you're always getting. Right? So there's a, a simple understanding when you buy a new car. They call it the new car smell. Most people associate the new car with the joy of getting a new car. In other words, the car becomes the thing that they got that makes them happy. They don't realize that it's possibly that they struggled for a while to find the car, and when they bought the car, they ended the struggle. And it was the ending of the struggle that made them feel happy. What if the absence of struggle is where the joy is, and each time we get something, for a moment we feel fulfilled because we're simply no longer struggling in that moment for more. And in that non-struggle, we feel happy. But we're associating that happiness with the thing. We think it's the thing that made us feel better. And I want it all is in our society. And if you live for having it all, what you have is never going to be enough. There's different levels of enoughness. In an environment where more is better, enough is like a horizon that's always receding it's always off in the distance. There's no there there. You lose the ability to identify for yourself the point of sufficiency where you feel like, I have enough. I don't need more. I don't need more time or I don't need more work. And again, it's not just about money, but money is a big part of our society and how we measure what we're doing. And we're doing it all for often fulfillment, sense of love, a sense of community, a sense of belonging that we associate with money as a gateway to having that. They call that the more is better loop. Paul Watchell calls it the psychological cul-de-sac of the American dream. The belief that more is better, therefore what I have can't be enough. Even when I get the more that I believe would make my life better, if I'm still operating out of the belief that more is better, I have to go get more. More is always more. More can never be enough. And I'm harping a bit on the more dynamic because we have to understand it. It's not that you're doing anything wrong. You've been literally uh, matured and marinated in a society that is based on acquisition of more. And we have to look at that because if you think of budgeting as a deprivation or spending money as something that you're entitled to do because you work hard, you're missing out on the very dynamic that put you into that mindset in the first place. So we want to build a personal financial roadmap in a way using the PenFin or other tools, working with financial advisors or other professionals with certified liability advisors, certified financial planners, um, working with CPAs, any financial professional can help you with your roadmap, but they can't necessarily help you with the mindset you need to succeed with that map. So I've mentioned this book, Your Money or Your Life. The title itself was transformative for me because it's a simple question. If someone came up on the street put a gun to your head and said, your money or your life, what would you decide? Would you say, nah, shoot me. My money's too important. In that moment, when someone says your money or your life, you know immediately what you would choose. But what if you had to make that decision over 50, 60, 80 years? Step by step, day by day, Every day, that decision was 
answered your money. And again, money, as we'll look at it, we're going to define it in a way that's maybe very different than how you think about money. But if you had to make that decision every day over 80 years, you don't see the results of your decision until the last day when the gun's to your head and you have to ask yourself, my money or my life, what did I choose over time? And what does money really represent? But in the moment, if you have to make that decision right now, what would you choose? See, money can't buy happiness. Is that true or false for you? It's different, and I've had it answered by different people in different ways. And the best things in life are free. Honestly answer that question for yourself. Not what would other people say, but for you. Money can or can't buy happiness. And how does it compare to the things in your life that we say are free? Take a moment. You see the little thinking icon. Use it and answer these honestly for yourself. I want you to rate your stuff. Write down 10 items that you've purchased, starting with the most expensive thing that you own. For example, your house, your car, uh, your college experience, etc. And then I want you to check the box that seems most appropriate for that item. In other words, was this item something I needed for my survival? Was it something I wanted for my comfort to make life easier? Is it something I wanted for luxury? Meaning this is really comfortable, well beyond survival and comfort. I just wanted this thing. Right, I really wanted it, but not just because it made life a little bit easier. I just wanted it as, a, as an indulgence. And then clutter. Clutter is something that you bought for probably one of the three items above. You either felt you needed it to survive, you felt you needed it for comfort, or you felt you needed it for luxury. But it ended up just being clutter. Not really fulfilling at all. Take a moment and do this exercise for yourself. It'll look something like this, and you can use this as a worksheet. Write down one, two, three, four, five, as many as, as you can, and check each box whether you think right now that item fits today. Now, let's look at something called the fulfillment curve. When you were small, when you were a little baby, it didn't take much to make you happy. But the one thing you learned was that fulfillment comes from the outside of us. You believe that and it was reinforced daily with food and nurture and care. And as you get older, you start having the ability to fulfill some of those needs for yourself. Oftentimes as kids, we get an allowance. We start to reinforce that I'm doing work to support myself and I'm getting money for that work when I babysit and that money giving me that ability to take care of myself leads to a sense of fulfillment. So in other words, fulfillment and the money that is often spent on that fulfillment, those two lines intersect at this first stage of survival. Maslow called it the needs hierarchy. I need food. I need water. I need shelter. I need clothing. These are things that are important for survival. Needing a jacket might be something you need for survival. Needing a Gucci jacket would clearly be something beyond that. When we go from buying necessities to comforts, we need more money to do that. So as I go from just surviving to starting to develop a sense of being comfortable in my own life, I am reinforced in understanding that more money means more fulfillment. So I'm reinforced as I have, and this is true. I'm not saying it's not true. This is a truth. As you can survive and take care of yourself, it's incredibly fulfilling. And as you can provide comforts for yourself, as you earn and make more money, that too is incredibly fulfilling. But eventually, we start to spend beyond the comfort and we move to the stage of luxuries. Now, these are important, 
But at this stage, at the stage of luxury, we believe that money is fulfillment. At this point, those two become in many ways synonymous. In other words, the more money I made, the more fulfilled I was at the level of survival and comfort. Wouldn't that be true at the level of luxury? And it is. But the diminishing returns have started. The incremental fulfillment that the luxuries bring requires an exponential amount of more money. In other words, there's a huge gap here where you're working much harder for a little bit more fulfillment, and that much harder is in the form of a great deal more money that is needed for those luxuries. But again, at this stage of our life, we are starting to realize that these luxuries require more money. We barely notice that it's taking exponential more money for smaller and smaller levels of fulfillment. And one day, we all hit a fulfillment ceiling where more is not better, but often by that point, we're trapped, meaning that we've started acquiring and all we know how to do to have more fulfillment in our lives is to spend more and to spend more we have to make more and to make more we have to work longer hours and to work longer hours we have to trade off the time with the people or the services or the other things that we found really fulfilling. The formula that we develop for money as fulfillment actually starts to work against us. You see, we keep working harder and harder, requiring more and more money to be spent, and we don't even realize that the fulfillment has started to move down. Because everything we bought, every subscription that we added, every service has to be acquired, which takes time. It has to be learned. It has to be operated. In many cases, it has to be stored. The storage buildings and fulfill in the, the uh, additional home storage and remote storage. Think about how much time and energy we spend just storing the things we bought, thinking we would bring more fulfillment to our lives. And then it breaks. And the more stuff we have, the more it breaks. It has to be fixed. If it's not paid for in cash, you're having to service the debt and make payments on those items. And then we have to protect those items from others because the more stuff we have, the more stuff that could be taken. And then we have so much stuff, we see other people that have so little, and we even feel guilty about it. And then at times we feel like we need that newness again to be excited about it. So that old boat is great, but we need to upgrade it and get the new boat. And then when we finally decide that we don't need it anymore, it's effort and energy to sell it. We don't think about all of these steps that go into each edition of more stuff because we don't realize we're so focused on fulfillment, yet knowing simultaneously that fulfillment isn't there anymore. The spending doesn't bring us the fulfillment it once did. It, in, in many ways, it brings a sense of burden or even futility. And I'm not saying this is right for you. I'm asking you to examine your own life and ask, have you gone through or are you at a stage in your life where you've started to notice that sometimes the spending is just a pattern? It's not really a choice. You're just doing it because the new iPhone just came out. Is it that much more fulfilling than the old iPhone? And would it have been even more fulfilling to not have that extra $30 a month payment on your bill to have the newer version? Because at some point, you will end up back where you started. And this is the point where you really have that money or your life discussion with yourself, where you ask, okay, how did I play the game? And did I ever consider that there might be an enough? When I look at what is enough for me, how could I live here and not live here or find myself here wishing I'd done it differently? So why does money equal fulfillment not work anymore for you? It's the law of diminishing returns. It's built right into nature. If you take aspirin for a headache, it works. If you take lots of aspirin every day, you build up a diminishing return. 
If you drink alcohol, one drink, two drinks, you'll feel it. But if you drink alcohol all the time, you don't even notice it. Everything that you do in your life has a law of diminishing returns built right into it. So at some point, the fulfillment curve is just like that. More is no longer better. There's a peak on your fulfillment curve, and it's called enough. And by looking at what is enough, you're really asking yourself, how do I live at peak fulfillment? And the bigger question, what if living at peak fulfillment was also a point where the time I spend making money was really aligned with who I am overall as a person. It's not always easy to recognize it enough. You have to learn how to do it, just like you learn how to do anything else. So one, when we face the facts, we have to make peace with the past. Everything you've done to get to this stage in your life, you've done to get to this stage in your life. That's okay. As Oprah says, forgiveness is giving up all hope of a better past. So simply make peace with the past that you have. And one of the things that we know is that you've made a lot of money in your lifetime at whatever age you're at. So go back for a minute and look at what you came up with in your last worksheet and ask yourself, how much money have I made so far in my lifetime? And if you want, as a bonus, ask yourself, based on what I've made so far, what am I likely to make? For most people, they'll make three, four, or five million dollars over their lifetime, 40 to 50 years of working. As a combined family, it may be more. But you're making a lot of money. So the problem is not a scarcity of not making enough money. It must be something else. Make sure you've put those lifetime earnings in the worksheet so you have them, as well as your income. And if you go ahead now, I would like you to complete that personal financial statement. Put in all your assets and all your liabilities and look at your personal financial net worth because this is a contrast to compare all the money that you've made in your lifetime with what has been left over. In other words, if you've made a million dollars in your lifetime and you're 38 years old and you and your wife have made together $1.2 million, and your personal net worth right now is $250,000, there's no right or wrong. It's just a fact. But you can't have awareness without knowing what are the facts. In this case, how much of the money that we've made in our lifetime have we been able to keep and or maintain for our future self? Because that's all about just creating awareness. Because I can tell you, fulfillment is indexed at a certain level by money. From the standpoint of comfort, the ability to to survive and then have comfort, and ultimately to have luxuries in your life. All of those progressively create a level of fulfillment to a point. What we want to avoid is looking at how much money you're spending that's no longer providing you that fulfillment. So what do you have to show for it? On your worksheet, do your best to go ahead and complete Uh, Put in your assets and your liabilities and see what shows up as your net worth today. And look at that as a percentage of what you've made so far in your life. So whatever you've saved at this point in your life, see and accept that this is the current reality. It is what it is. Reflect on any choices you've made. Again, forgiveness is giving up all hope of a better past. But you've made choices to get to this stage. And then understand that you have control over the responses that you make in the future. And your responses that you make in the future are going to be a function of your level of awareness and the ability that you develop to simply ask yourself, is this fulfilling to me? So all change is personal. Again, avoid comparing yourself to others and simply ask yourself, am I building greater awareness about the cash I have, the cash flow, and the spending, and how do I start to consider the role that fulfillment has in my overall spending. So before the next course, look at your answers that you've answered for yourself. Look at the results of what you've done. And I encourage you to watch a little video called The Story of Stuff. It's an interesting video that looks at this dynamic of stuff 
and the impact it's had in our society as we think about this whole dynamic of mourners that's often driving us to spend. And then again, make sure you complete your worksheet and get that current through the current stage. Make any notes here on the Story of Stuff video, anything that stood out to you. Any insights that you have from part two, any notes or answers, keep those for yourself as well. And I have an assignment for you between now and the next, uh, uh, you don't have to wait till the next workshop, but or the next time that you take this video series, part three, but for the next 30 days, at the end of each week, I want you to write down the number of hours that you spent in these categories for the week. How much time did you spend at work? How much time did you spend driving? How much time did you spend dressing? How much time did you spend eating meals while you were working? How about decompression? That would be time that you spend when I come home. Now, I just need to veg out for an hour or just leave me alone. Do you spend time on escape entertainment? How about vacations and rewards? Do there have any vacations during that week that you set up for yourself or a, a spa day in the afternoon rewards you took? Were you sick at all during the week? And did you have any servants that you had to manage? And when I say servants, these are people that you hired to do things that you could do, but you don't have time to because you were working. The objective is to see how many hours you actually spend in a working environment in the course of a week. More and more we spend time with our phones and working in the evenings and on the weekends. And for four weeks, I'd like you to track that. Again, this is not about judgment, it's about awareness. To know what you're actually making right now in the work that you do, you need to know the hours that you're actually working. So do this for you and for your spouse or partner and have those available because we'll put them in our worksheet in our next session. So in part three, what you can expect is we're gonna look a little at what is money? What is life energy? And how does that play a role in fulfillment? And what is fiscal bliss? What is a dynamic where we're starting to think about and working to live at a level of enough all the time?